Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. You're, you're in the right place for the Sight and Sound Bites webinar. We're going to get started here in just a moment. I'm going to give uh, everybody some time to get in here. We have a great program for you today. I'm not muted, am I? Thanks for coming. We're going to get started here in, in just a moment with today's program. All right. Well, uh, welcome and thanks for coming today. This is our webinar series called Sight and Sound Bites, brought to you by the Ioneer Foundation. My name is Craig Smith, and I'm a senior development associate with the foundation. This bi-weekly webinar series highlights research in the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. This research is only possible uh, due to philanthropic support, so we, we thank everybody who has supported us. I want to go over a few housekeeping things for today. Uh, for these webinars, we do disable the chat function, so you won't be able to use that. However, you can submit questions for our presenters uh, through the Q&A feature. And after the presentation, we'll go over these questions for you. We do ask that you refrain from asking any personal questions that may not be relevant to the broader audience. However, we will try to answer these questions offline and get back to you after the program um, via email. And as always, you can send additional questions to me uh, through email, which is just craig at iandear.org. We've also enabled captioning for this program, so please feel free to use the subtitles today as you follow along. And we'll also be recording this webinar and adding it to our website as we always do. So if you're not able to view the entire thing, or if you'd go, like to go back and view it later or share with anybody else, you can find that on our website at iandear.org. And we will also be adding everybody who attends today to our mailing list. So you'll be able to receive periodic updates on all the various research taking place within the departments through blogs, newsletters, and future webinar programs. Today's presentation is titled Refractive Surgery, Everything You Need to Know About Surgically Repairing Your Vision. I'm very happy to be joined by two of our esteemed faculty members, Dr. Deepinder Dhaliwal and Dr. Gaurav Prakash. Dr. Prakash is an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and part of the Cornea, Cataract, and External Disease Services with the UPMC Eye Center. And Dr. Dhaliwal is a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, director of refractive surgery, and director of cornea service at UPMC Eye Center. Dr. Dhaliwal also serves as the director of the UPMC Laser Vision Center, the Associate Medical Director of the Campbell Ophthalmic Microbiology Lab, and has recently been appointed as the Clinical Co-Director of the Corneal Stem Cell Task Force at the University of Pittsburgh. And Dr. Dolly will be kicking us off today. So Dr. Waldo. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really delightful to be here. Uh, albeit virtually with all of you. Um, and we're so excited about this topic. So today's title is Refractive Surgery, Everything You Need to Know About Surg Surgically Correcting Your Vision. This is a topic that's near and dear to our hearts uh, because really we started in refractive surgery at the UPMC Eye Center a long, long time ago, even before the uh, eczema lasers were even approved by the FDA. We were fortunate to be one of the sites that were part of that pivotal FDA trial that actually got LASIK approved by the FDA. So we have a very long history of doing refractive surgery. And indeed, we have at the UPMC Eye Center, the oldest continuously running refractive surgery program in the city. So not only do we love doing refractive surgery, we love teaching it and really sharing our um, research and expertise with, um, with our colleagues. So we take this very seriously. Now, importantly, you know, refractive surgery is a lot of different things. And what we're gonna focus on today um, is actually refractive surgery for people who really want to reduce their dependence on glasses and contact lenses. So 
now in this kind of day and age, we've got we've gotten to the point where cataract surgery is also refractive surgery, but we covered that in a different a different uh, sight and sound bite. So we're not going to be talking about that. So this really is for people who don't have a cataract, don't have glaucoma, don't have macular degeneration. This is for people who have healthy eyes and who really want to kind of think about options instead of putting on glasses every day or putting in a pair of contact lenses every day, thinking of options to reduce their dependence on those tools in order to see better. So that's really, really important. Now, I wanna nip something in the bud because uh, a friend of mine asked me this morning, uh, she said, well, what about these reading glasses? Can I, is there a surgery that can help me get rid of these reading glasses? And I wish the answer was yes, but unfortunately we don't have a surgery yet that can give you excellent distance vision and excellent near vision in each eye. Okay, so we don't have a, a, a laser correction procedure as yet that can help us with that. So we have a lot of exciting options that we're going to share with you today, but the reading glasses thing, we just don't have a surgery for that. We do have an interesting eye drop that was recently approved called Vuity. So that can help um, decrease your dependence on reading glasses. It's not for everybody, but that is something we have and that's medical management. And, but for surgery, we're gonna focus on um, you know, these options. And so to kick things off, I'm going to call on my dear colleague, Dr. Gaurav Prakash, who is really just uh, an amazing um, collaborator, surgeon, colleague, and we're so fortunate he's here. He's worked internationally in India and in Abu Dhabi, and now uh, we are able to recruit him here to be at the University of Pittsburgh, and he has a wealth of information and experience, and so he's going to start things off, and then we're actually going to show you some videos of, of real you know, surgeries that we have performed and how this kind of uh, fits into, into the kind of framework that we've built. So Dr. Prakash, why don't you kick things off? Thanks, Dr. Dhaliwal. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today for the Sight and Sound Bite seminar today. As Dr. Dhaliwal said, our aim is to give you a primer regarding what refractive surgery is, what it covers, what should we be looking at, and kind of clear a direction which can help you to understand the aims and expectations from the procedure. So we kind of use a large umbrella of words called as elective vision correction for refractive surgery because we try to look at this as a lifestyle enhancement choice and therefore the word elective comes in over there. The aims of discussion today will be to understand the principles behind elective vision correction, including LASIK. Look at the options you have as a, as a candidate, what options can suit you well, and kind of do the matching to see which kind of procedure suits which kind of eye, because each eye is different, each person is different, everybody's jobs are different, everybody's requirements are different. So being an elective procedure, we wanna make sure that we can customize it as much as possible. And therefore that'll be the third part of the, uh, the, the discussion we'll have, what suits everybody best, best. So let's talk a bit about eye anatomy, just a basic primer. I promise that I'll not go much in details for you guys, but just to know what's happening. If you have used an SLR camera, the eye looks like an SLR camera. And, and once we understand that, it's easy to go along. The front of the eye, the cornea and the lens, they act like a lens combination in SLR. Uh, the iris is the diaphragm, which kind of controls the amount of light going inside your eye. Then you have got an autofocus in terms of the ciliary muscle, which kind of makes things become better as you look up close over the further far away. Then you've got an anti-reflective camera body, the sclera, and really uh, the optic nerve is just like a USB connection, which makes you see better. Now, most of elective vision correction works on the front three parts, the iris, cornea, and the lens, and that's why I wanted to get this out for us to understand the area of the eye we're working on. We're working in front of the eye. So a question I've been asked is, why do we need glasses in the first place? What, what makes us see not as sharp? 
In an ideal world, none of us should be wearing glasses. The distance rays which fall in the eye should focus back on the eye. This does not happen because sometimes you have myopia, which basically means that the length of the eye is a bit longer or the eye is too steeper. So we want to make the cornea less steeper by giving you minus glasses. That's called as myopia. On the other hand, we have hypermetropia. When the power of convergence is lesser, the eye as a combination is a bit weaker. So you're gonna add a strong prescription of a plus glass in front of the eye. That's, that's the basic 101 regarding what refractive error is, basically myopia and hypermetropia. And as Dr. Taliwal said, glasses for reading near, uh, that is presbyopia. Unfortunately, as of now, the technology is still not mature enough to work on that. But we have strong, solid technology which has been working on myopia and hypermetropia. Correction. So let's talk about LASIK and elective vision correction. So as I talked about elective, it means that our aim is to reduce the dependence on glasses using laser and surgical procedures. It's informed choice procedure. I mean, a lot of people who are comfortable with the glasses, they can stay there. A lot of people who, who, who want to get rid of the glasses for their lifestyle or to enhance their quality of vision, refractive sur surgery is the next best step. So basically, elective vision correction is a, is a very involved collaboration between optics and surgery. And the reason why this is important is because the eye is such a complicated structure. We measure more than 2,000 data points on the eye whenever we're doing LASIK. We use technology which has been used in astronomy, uh, like the Hubble telescope, to look at the smaller details inside the eye. We have been doing refractive surgery for more than 25 years now, uh, and, and we have robust safety and efficacy algorithms. It's one of the most commonly performed surgeries or laser procedures in the world as of now, which, which which proves the point that it has been really successful. But the important point is to rule out who is an idle candidate. If we will randomly screen 100 people who wear glasses, only 70% will be good candidate for LASIK. And when I mean good candidate, that does not mean that the eye has a pathology. It's just because our our criteria are so stringent because we want to make sure we get the best results out and make it as safe as possible. Sometimes seemingly normal eyes with normal people might not be good candidates for refractive surgery. And that's why a screening process becomes very, very important. First of all, we have to have somebody who is, who is billing for the procedure, obviously. And then you have to have realistic expectations. Remember, the laser is changing the shape of your eye changing it for forever, right? So we do expect lesser dependent glasses, which is the most common outcome, but you can always have a small prescription left, which can need for small for, for reading small prints or looking at something very far away. So even though it's laser, even though it's precise at the level of microns, we always expect that you might need in a small minority of patients, around 5% patients, a small prescription of glasses. Obviously, you need to have a stable prescription. A moving target is never good. So you should be at least 21 years or more, or more in, in the US. Some countries that limit is 18 years. It's more of the understanding that beyond that point, you are aware of the surgery, you know the risk and benefits, and more importantly, your prescription of glasses is stable. So these are the two very important criteria, stable glass prescription and your age. Anybody who's 15 or 16 or 12, obviously it's not a good candidate because we don't know what their prescription is going to land in a few years. Should be in good health. That's the most important part. You should not have any uncontrolled diseases like, like Jogren's or lupus or anything which, is, which cannot be taken care of or diabetes. Um, you should have good vision currently with glasses or contact lenses. If you do not see 2020 with your glasses or contact lenses, there's a very high chance you'll not see that 2020 after LASIK ulcer. Essentially, LASIK is like trying to imprint or 3D print the shape of the glasses or the contact lenses on your cornea. If you don't see it well without them, you with well with them, you're not able to self with, with well without them also. In terms of ocular health, we are often asked, what are the outliers? So if you have conditions in which the cornea could be weak or thin or like keratoconic, which is a pathology itself, you might not be a good candidate for refractive surgery. And obviously each case varies. So this discussion happens in-house and we're more than happy to screen if you have any 
questions or concerns regarding if you're a good candidate or not. Uh, you should not have any cataract. You should not have uncontrolled glaucoma. You should not have significant dry eyes. With the amount of Zoom and, uh, uh, and online exposure we have, a lot of people have dry eyes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uncontrolled dry eyes, which is, which is uh, 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 requiring therapeutic medications. Pregnancy and lactation. If you're planning pregnancy in the next few months, if you are currently pregnant or you're lactating, we tend to avoid any elective surgeries, which includes elective eye surgeries in LASIK. Moreover, in LASIK, when you're pregnant or you're lactating, your hormone levels can fluctuate and your corrections can vary. So it's always, it's always good to wait out for a time. When you're not lactating anymore, that's a good time to get a screening done for LASIK, not before that. So if you go through the literature or the patient information available regarding LASIK, you'll, you'll, you'll hear about a lot of names. You'll hear about LASIK, HG LASIK, PRK, LASIK, SMILE, ICL, similar sounding names, right? So the premise obviously is that we can either correct your glass, collect your, prescript, your, your prescription by using either glasses or using a contact lens or changing the cornea or doing something at the level of the lens. So these are the four basic things. We talk about glasses and contact lenses before we talk about the surgical procedures now. So we can divide this into two different uh, streams. We can look at procedures done at the level of the cornea or at the lens. If you're doing at the at the cornea, basically you're outside the eye, you're doing a laser. Examples are surgeries like LASIK, PRK, and SMILE. Uh, Dr. Dhaliwal will cover these surgeries much more in details when we go forward in the presentation, but just for understanding, I'm trying to enumerate them over here. And we can correct the prescription at the lens level. When we go inside the eye, take out the lens and put a new lens, or just add on an additional lens to the eye. When we replace that lens, it's called as a cataract surgery. But if we just add one more lens in the eye, that's called as an ICL or an implantable collamor lens, which is an exciting new technology for patients who are not good candidates for LASIK. And we can offer them a much more safer procedure in their scenarios. If we are looking at the cornea, you are often asked, what's the difference between LASIK and PRK? Now, once you make a flap, it's called as LASIK. When you don't make a flap, it's called as PRK, as simple as that. The problem with PRK is that it has a longer downtime. It has more pain in the initial post-operative period. Your healing variations are much more, but it doesn't have a flap. So if you are prone to trauma, if you're in a sport like basketball, or probably in a sport in which you are, or you're a combat fighter, you might consider PRK. However, having said that, uh, patients who are who are in, in, in combat, like, like Navy SEALs, it has been shown that LASIK is a safer standard procedure for them. The healing is quicker and they can go back to work much more faster. Uh, similar safety for both the procedures, but if it look in terms of efficacy and ease of comfort, LASIK wins hand down. At the lens, if you are a young patient that's than 45 years of age, you have a high myopia where we cannot do LASIK. We can put a lens inside the eye. This is called an implantable columnar lens. We don't replace the old lens because you don't have a cataract. However, if you have more than 45 and you have a bit of cataract, we can actually remove that lens and put a new lens inside the eye and, and we can reduce the glass prescription. So that works the same way. Now, so essentially patients who are Good candidates for refractive surgery are the ones which have healthy people with healthy eyes and reasonable minds. If you have a cataract, you're not a good candidate for LASIK. And patients who have collagen diseases, pregnant or nursing, signs of keratoconus, unrealistic expectations, dry eyes are not good candidates. At this point, I'll request Dr. Dhaliwal to start with her uh, thoughts on this. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Prakash. That was excellent. So uh, if you could just give me the ability to control the slides. I think you should have it because I, I have it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, excellent. So yeah, that was great. That was such a great framework. So the, the bottom line is, you know, the surgical options, LASIK, 
PRK, smile, these things work on the cornea. And basically we're changing the focus of how light is entering the eye. So if you're nearsighted or farsighted, the light that comes into the eye is not falling exactly on the retina and the vision is blurred. And so what we need to do is change how that light is basically bent in the eye or that's called refracting, right? So then we can use some type of refractive surgery to help change those light rays. And the important thing is uh, when you're nearsighted, we wanna flatten the cornea. When you're farsighted, we kind of wanna steepen it. Uh, and those are, those are the principles. Now, being realistic is super important. This slide, I think, is, is really critical because, you know, if we have patients, sometimes we have people that come to see us and they say, look, I, I have been nearsighted all my life, so I, I take my glasses off to read. I see reasonably well with my glasses for the distance, but after surgery, I want to be able to see near and far without my glasses, right? So what happens is, is when you're nearsighted and you're past the age of 43 or so, you're basically cheating. You're basically lifting up your glasses and you're reading. And that is something that you're able to do because nearsightedness gives you that ability to see near. Now, if you correct your vision for distance, then what happens is you're going to lose that reading ability. So it's, it's a confusing thing because basically it'll be like you're wearing contacts all the time. So you can't have it both ways. Um, so after the age of 43 or so, nearsighted people will lose that ability to see up close if your distance vision is fully corrected. So after LASIK, et cetera, if you're, if you're aiming targeting distance, then you will need reading glasses just like everybody else. So that's really important. So we spend a lot of time talking to our, our um, the people that come in to see us, our patients who want are interested in this. We do an extensive evaluation and we spend so much time on who is a good candidate. And it's all about really listening to you and what you want. What do you expect from surgery? Because one of my favorite quotes is happiness equals reality minus expectations, right? So we want you to be happy after surgery. That's the most important thing for us. And so if you have unreasonable expectations or unrealistic expectations, then we need to make sure that that's, those are modified. You know, we might we, so we work very hard on kind of managing expectations. So you're happy with reality after surgery. So uh, that's, that's very important. So now what we're going to do is actually look at some surgeries. So this is LASIK first. And what we do is just topical anesthesia. And I'm going to, um, we just use drops. There's no needles, nothing scary. And what I'm going to do is what we do is we put we check some measurements and what we're gonna do is put a, oh, excuse me one second, let me go back. I wanna start this and then go a little faster through it. Let's see. So there's the eye, we're checking measurements um, of the thickness. And then what we're gonna do is put a suction ring on the eye and I'm gonna see if I can go through this. Okay, so I can't control the video. Let's see. There we go. So what we do is we put a suction ring on the eye and then what we're gonna do is that is gonna help us with this is the flat making laser. So what we do is we kind of go under a laser, we're gonna create a flap and that's all laser working to create a flap. And then we take the suction ring off and we're gonna actually lift up the flap and flip it back. And then we're gonna go ahead and use the other laser now, which is going to start sculpting the cornea. And after that's done, that, now that sculpting is like Dr. Prakash mentioned. The sculpting is super important because what happens there is we're able to change 
the correction, kind of that 3D imprinting. We're able to change, you know, why your vision's blurred for nearsighted people. We're flattening the cornea. And then what we're going to do is put the flap back in position. And there you go. And that's LASIK. So um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting procedure. And after we put the flap back in position, you know, we can irrigate underneath and make sure it's like perfectly kind of in position. And, and that's what we do. And the beauty of the cornea is that the flap will adhere to the underlying cornea without any sutures. And every time we do this procedure, it's like magic. It really is. It's really beautiful how the cornea can just kind of adhere um, and stick down. So after about three minutes, it's just totally adherent. And we're just checking the, the edges here to make sure everything looks good. And there you go. So what we did is we created a flap, we flipped it back, we did the laser, and then we put the flap back in position. And um, I, I sped up through that because I wanted to make sure we had enough time to go through all the procedures. And if we do, then I can go back and show you kind of blow by blow, but, but that video is a little bit long. So you got the idea. LASIK is where we're um, creating a flap. And after we create that flap, you know, we can access the underlying cornea. And so we do whatever sculpting we, we need to do with the eczema laser. And that eczema laser is really phenomenal. It sculpts using this incredible technology, which va basically vaporizes your, the corneal tissue. So it doesn't work by heating or by charring or, you know, anything destructive. It really just vaporizes the cornea. So we program the laser with very, very sophisticated optics. So we measure your eye, we find out why your vision is blurred, and then we can, um, the, the, actually this special machine actually can design the perfect treatment for your eye. So this is custom LASIK. What custom means is we measure your vision and basically it's like a fingerprint. It's very particular to just you. So we measure your vision with these very sophisticated, we call them aberrometers, and it shows us why your vision's blurred. And then as we do that, we, we get that information and the aberrometer will actually design the perfect treatment to take care of all those, you know, kind of reasons why your vision's blurred. And so in doing that, that's saved on, you know, by the computer. And then we just import that into our laser. So the laser treatment that's done is really sophisticated and it doesn't match anybody else. So even though you might be, you know, your contact lens prescription might be minus three, that treatment, because we're doing custom, it's even if you're a minus three, it's not going to be the same because in custom LASIK, it's going to look at each individual eye. And just like a fingerprint is specific for each patient, that treatment is going to be very special. Now, after doing that, what's amazing is that patients who have the surgery, they actually feel like they see in high definition. It's really, really interesting because we are treating with custom LASIK and custom PRK. We're treating more than that's corrected with contact lenses and glasses. So that's the ability of, of the technology now. It's so sophisticated that custom treatments can actually do more than our glasses or contact lenses can do. So this is uh, very sophisticated. And that's why we're very particular about your surface. You can't have dryness. And that's another reason why, I know this is a pain point for a lot of people, another reason why it's important for you not to wear your contact lenses 
for like about three weeks until we can get those, you know, very important measurements um, that we're going to use for surgery. So when you come in for a consultation, typically it's okay if you've worn contacts, we're just going to say, you know, generally, are you a candidate or not? And then we bring you back after you have your contact lenses out for a long time, of at least about three weeks. Um, in order to get those precise measurements, because those are one the, the measurements that we're going to use to design your special treatment, your custom treatment. So we want the corneas to be bounced back into their natural shape. Contact lenses, believe it or not, they can warp the cornea. They can actually change the shape of your cornea. And we don't want to sculpt some, you know, some warped, warp into your cornea, we want it to be as good as it can be. All right, so we went through LASIK and now we're gonna just do PRK and PRK is no flap. So how do we remove the surface cells? We have to gain access to the cornea. And what we do is we actually um, brush them off. We actually create a little um, sophisticated corneal abrasion and, um, and we have to remove the surface cells so, you know, we're just going to remove them in the center of the cornea there. And uh, we're just kind of marking out the center. And this is a little brush that we use that actually helps remove the cells. It's a very sophisticated brush that will only remove the surface cells. And so um, this is working. And you saw in the other procedure, there's actually a laser that does this here. It's just a brush. And let's see if we can get a little bit faster there. So then after the brush is used, we polish the cornea. We might have to, you know, take off a few more cells. And then this is the eczema laser working. And that's working right on the surface of the cornea and doing the treatment. We're lining it up and it's gonna sculpt and it really doesn't look like much um, as it's working because the beam is actually invisible. So, you know, that's firing, that's working on the cornea. And let me get my, there you go. You can kind of see a little bit of changes, but that's how the laser works. And then what we do is we rinse the cornea and then we put a nice bandage contact lens on this cornea after we're done because there's no flap to put back you have to heal all the cells that we just removed. So PRK is actually the eczema laser, that really beautiful eczema laser that we talked about that's very precise and can sculpt the cornea. That's the same as LASIK and PRK. We use the same laser in both procedures. The difference is in LASIK, we create a laser flap and then do the laser and then put the flap back down. In PRK, there's no flap. We just remove the surface cells, we do the treatment, and then you have to heal the cells. So we put a contact lens on to help you heal the cells. This is just a bandage contact lens. And that actually will just help you um, kind of heal underneath and have minimal discomfort. Uh, so this is a non-laser based procedure and this is called ICL. And this is for that Dr. Prakash talked about in patients who have a moderate to high degrees of nearsightedness. This is actually surgery in the eye. This is not using a laser. And this is for patients who might have very dry eyes or very thin corneas or who are really, you know, fairly nearsighted. And we're actually putting an implant in the eye. It's like implanting a contact lens in the eye. So what we do is we put it in very gently. And now this is not cataract surgery. We did not remove anything from the eye. We're just kind of implanting this contact lens. And you can see we're not changing anything. We're just putting in. And then this, that last part that you see, we're just, we put in a little bit of uh, a substance that helps us keep spaces and we just um, are removing any of those um, kind of that uh, viscoelastic substance so that the pressure is, is not high the next day. So uh, the ICL is really kind of an amazing um, advance in terms of 
helping patients focus better when they're, you know, when they actually have uh, moderate to high levels of nearsightedness. And again, because we don't remove anything, I mean, this procedure is essentially reversible or this technology is removable. So this is the only thing that, you know, if you say, ah, you know, I don't know, I kind of want to have my nearsightedness back. We can actually just take this lens out and you would be back to where you started. For LASIK and PRK, we cannot give you back tissue that's been vaporized. Um, this is um, a relatively new procedure. This is called SMILE. And this is going back to actually laser based. This is a different type of laser. And what this laser is doing is actually, basically this is flapless LASIK, if you will, um, because we don't create a full flap. This is called small incision lenticle extraction. And basically the laser is happening inside the cornea. And this is for people who are nearsighted and have astigmatism. And basically what's done is the laser is doing its sculpting inside the cornea. And now you're seeing what's happening. There's a little bit of very gentle dissection. There's no flap. And we're going to then remove this little lenticle. And this, you have to kind of use a device that helps you kind of go in and separate the cap. You're going to dissect into the cornea there. You have to remove kind of these little adhesions that might be there. So you're kind of dissecting. And then at the end, a cap will be removed. Again, these videos are a little bit long, so I'm trying to speed them up for you. So then what happens at the very end, then you're going to, we basically extract that little piece of tissue. Now that is what would have been vaporized basically by the eczema laser. So if this was, you know, LASIK, we would have made a flap and then vaporized that little lenticle. But here the, the laser is basically just kind of um, dissecting it. And then we actually remove it and you saw that little piece. So it's just another way to reduce nearsightedness. We're actually removing that tissue. So very interesting. And this is kind of flapless LASIK, kind of similar to that. So in conclusion, refractive surgery when performed in the correct person can provide excellent visual results. And we didn't talk a lot about the data and the results, but I can tell you that, you know, people who have, who are good candidates and who have surgery, probably over, you know, 98% of people can really achieve their visual goals. Um, and it's a highly, highly successful surgery. The critical thing is to really seek consultation with a comprehensive refractive surgeon who can really assess whether you're a good candidate for surgery. And if you are, which is the best option for you? So it's not one size fits all, right? We don't do LASIK for everybody. We don't do PRK for everybody. We don't do ICLs for everybody. We choose which is the best procedure. And sometimes the best thing for you is no surgery at all. So that's super important. You know, sometimes being conservative is really the best thing. Now, like if you have, if you're really nearsighted and you have a mild cataract, it's actually not safe to go and do early cataract surgery. That's not safe because you have a high, higher rate of retinal detachment. So just, you know, go, jumping in and, and removing the lens is, is not always a good idea. So we have to look at your whole situation. It's a very, very personalized discussion. We get a lot of testing. We listen to what your goals are. We actually have you write down your goals in your own handwriting. So we read what you want. And we see if we have procedures that can match you. Has our technology advanced far enough that we can actually meet your goals? And then we have a long discussion about here are what we can offer you. Here's what we can hope to achieve. This is what's possible. This is what's not possible. And we kind of go through a whole discussion. And then based on that, 
we come to a con, you know conclusion whether we think this is a good idea or not and at the end of the day you know it's it's something that's very very exciting it really can enhance your life if you're a good candidate again it's super important to make sure you're a good candidate because if you push the envelope and you're not a good candidate and you have surgery you know we've seen kind of the good the bad the ugly we see unfortunately we see you know referrals for patients who are very unhappy for after laser vision correction for one reason or another and it's mainly because they probably were not good candidates to start with there can be issues your you know cornea can become unstable if it gets too thin things like that so another thing that i want to say is you know if you have healthy eyes no signs of cataract etc and you would like to inquire further feel free to call us we do you know complimentary evaluations uh 412-647-4797 and that's our refractive um coordinator and she can you know get you in for an evaluation and we're happy to see you again it's a very very personalized discussion, just like our surgeries become very personalized in terms of custom LASIK and custom PRK. Um, each discu discussion is very, very personal. So um, I'm ha we're happy to answer questions, but again, we wanna keep these questions general. A lot of times we have to look at all the maps, uh, your, your curvature maps, et cetera, to see if you're a good candidate. The corneal thickness is very important. So we're not gonna be able to say, oh yeah, you're a good candidate or not. Um, just by kind of seeing you and looking at you, we really need to get a lot of testing as well. So that's what I have. And um, we're happy to open it up to, to questions and comments. Thank you both. That was a, that was a great presentation. I certainly learned a lot. LASIK was something that I wasn't really familiar with, or, or I guess uh, laser surgery in general. So uh, we have a lot of questions already and, and we have a lot of time. So if you have any questions, please send them in through the Q&A function. Um, we're going to try to get to as many as we can. If we don't get to any, like I said, we will uh, certainly follow up through email. So uh, first question here, we'll dive right in, is how long does a typical LASIK procedure take? Dr. Prakash, you want to? Yeah. So a typical procedure, the actual laser time is less than two, two, two minutes combined, but the actual procedures are going to take around 10 minutes. But uh, you have to understand that the workup and testing, so you have to keep at least half a day free for the procedure. The actual laser time is much, much lesser as you talked about, two minutes, that's it. Okay. Uh, so you already talked about the rate of, a rate of success a little bit, um, but how long does it typically take to see, uh, see results for these types of surgeries? So it, it depends which surgery, but it's, pretty instantaneous it's it's really wild i mean when you when you sit up you know whether you're having lasik or prk or even an icl i mean these procedures are fast very rapid visual recovery a lot of people can kind of see the clock which is across the wall right when they sit up um and the next day we've gotten so spoiled with our technology i have to say with custom lasik and custom prk now the next day, if you're not 2020, at least 2020, we're disappointed. We are expecting you the next day to have really excellent visual results. So it's rapid, but that means that you have to really rest that night. You have to let your eyes heal because if you don't let your eyes heal, uh, they'll be very dry. They'll be very irritated. And so you really need to um, just be very just kind of calm and, and keep your eyes closed as much as possible and let the flap heal. Or if you had PRK, kind of just rest your eyes so they don't get too dry. Um, and that's super important. And even with ICLs, your eyes can be very, very dry. So if you listen and you take it easy that day, then the, you know, you're, you're basically starting to see even that day, but the next day it's super exciting. It's, it's really kind of a celebration. So after watching some of those videos, all, you know, as, as interesting as they are, I think next question is a, a burning one is, is there any pain or discomfort involved both, you know, during or after the procedure? Sure. I mean, do, do you want to answer Dr. Prakash? I mean, yeah, sure. I can answer that. So uh, 
it's a bit uncomfortable getting a procedure done on your eyes, right? It's natural to feel a bit anxious regarding the procedure, but it's essentially it's a painless procedure. The laser is cold, it doesn't hurt your eye, it goes in, you don't feel anything. You might smell a bit of laser at times, but that, that's the only thing. Now, the, the, the thing is we use a device to hold your eye, which gives a lot of pressure on the eye. That's the only thing which you feel. I've never had anybody run away from the procedure so far. So I think you should be okay. I totally agree. While you're having surgery, there's no pain. There's just pressure. And, you know, we put an eyelid holder in, so you'll feel a little pressure on the eyelids. Um, again, I, I, I zoomed through that LASIK because I wanted you to have enough time for questions. Um, we could show the whole procedure if anyone's really interested. Um, but there is pressure from the suction ring. Again, as long as you're aware of it, it's not like super... Um, intense, you know, it's just, just feels like there's pressure on your eye. Afterwards, there can be some discomfort because, you know, again, we are doing surgery, it's surgery. So we have you take Motrin um, and rest. Those two things are critically important. If you don't do those things, yeah, it's going to be burny, teary, a little uncomfortable, but that's again, just for that first night, mainly after for LASIK. Um, and then you get through and really the next day it might be a little bit scratchy and you're fine. PRK takes longer to heal. So definitely with PRK, you'll have that protective bandage contact lens in for about a week. And so it's a little bit more uncomfortable, but overall not too bad. Again, if you rest and you lubricate your eyes and don't let them get too dry, then you're pretty good. Uh, can any of these laser procedures correct for PRISM? No. If you need prism in your glasses, you need prism in your glasses forever. So that's a really good question. And that's um, something where you you basically don't have your alignment is not correct in your eyes, right? The two eyes are not aligned. So laser will not improve that at all. Okay. And you guys mentioned that some, some people are not candidates and that might be due to having conditions such as lupus or other autoimmune disorders. Are there any options out there that they, they can use to improve their vision via surgery? So, you know, I, I'll, I'll take that one. I, you know, the thing is when you have an autoimmune disease, you don't really want to have a lot of elective eye surgeries. That's the bottom line. You know, you really want to just do less. Um, for elective eye surgery, there's a lot of healing and you are predisposed to having dry eyes when you do have autoimmune disease. So we generally um, would avoid elective eye surgery. There are a few cases if you have very mild disease that's very well controlled and there's no signs of dryness, maybe, but if it's significant uh, and you're on immunosuppressive therapy, et cetera, then probably not. Probably it's not a good idea just to go in and, and do surgery um, that's elective. I don't know, Dr. Prakash, what do you think? You're, you're muted still, Dr. Prakash. I'm trying to uh, unmute it, I'm sorry. So I agree with Dr. Dhaliwal. Uh, unfortunately, with autoimmune disorders, we are, I mean, these are essentially normalized, but we are doing an intervention. We might change how your eye behaves and, and, and sometimes it could be not optimal. So in abundance of caution, it should be that we should avoid procedures in uncontrolled autoimmune conditions. I mean, it doesn't take any, anything away from the eye, honestly. And I've had this discussion many times. It's a bit it's a bit because it's an elective procedure. A, B, you might need more interventions in future. Let's say, for example, you have you have dry eyes because of rheumatoid arthritis. You have situations when you can have infections because of that. You can have more problems because of that. You don't want to add one more procedure, which could be avoided in your eye. So on those lines, we, we want to avoid any intervention in eyes which have uncontrolled autoimmune conditions. Uh, for patients with ocular migraines, what are the limitations of refractive surgery since adjusting to new glasses or contacts can trigger migraines for these individuals? Is refractive surgery an easier option? 
So that's again a very good question, and I'll take this one. I mean, anything which can cause a visual trigger can cause a migraine, and that's that's a known fact. However, having said that, that is a lot of patients who have migraines and have uncontrolled migraines. I ask them to be on prophylactic medications when they're getting LASIK done. The laser is invisible. You don't see the laser. So the laser does not cause any trigger. It's, it's like adapting to that new pair of glasses. Once you have a new pair of glasses, it takes a few days of discomfort. So if you are having tendency towards having recent episodes of migraine, I want to wait for talking to the PCP, op open a dialogue with them, probably give you something prophylactic for the next few weeks, and then do LASIK. And that, that works very well. Once it is done and the eye is settled, the risks are, are next to none. Uh, so here's a, a compliment and a question. A wonderful presentation to you both. How does LASIK or PR, PRK impact future eye surgery, such as having cataract surgery? That's a great question. Um, so the good news is we have ability to operate right under that, you know, cornea that's had LASIK or PRK. So that's not a problem. The visualization is fine. The cataract surgery measurement of the implant is affected. And so we have really great devices now that can measure your eye and do and run very special formulas for the eye so that we're able to pick the correct lens implant when you do have cataract surgery. So it's it's not it's not as much of an issue as it used to be. There still is less predictability, but it's so much better. And our devices are getting better and better and better. So our measuring uh, capabilities are improving and our predictability for the lens implant. So we do that all the time. I mean, I do, we do cataract surgery in patients who have LASIK and PRK all the time now. And what's really crazy is because <laughs> I've been practicing since 1995 here at the at UPMC Eye Center, I'm actually doing cataract surgery on patients that I did LASIK on 20 years ago. So that's continuity of care for you. And it's wild because, you know, we're able to image the cornea and um, do these lens measurements and uh, follow the patients through. And, and overall, our results are, are, you know, pretty good. So we're, we're happy with that. Again, it's less predictable than having, you know, a cornea that has not had any surgery, but it's, it's, you know, again, um, expectations versus reality. You have to just, you know, know that you'll, you might need a thin pair of glasses and, uh, after surgery and, but, but we we're pretty able to get pretty close. A terrific presentation. Are there people who are candidates for both LASIK and PRK? And if so, how do you make the decision between the two? Dr. Prakash, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that, that's a great question. And it's, it's more regarding your lifestyle and choices. So LASIK overwhelmingly is the majority, the default choice because of the quicker recovery, the more titratable outcomes. And if you are if you're a physician or you're an engineer or you're somebody else who has a lot of screen use, like, like somebody who is the normal, normal young guy, right? LASIK is probably the best procedure for you. You, you will go back to work pretty quickly. You will recover back quickly. We have titratable outcomes. There are unique situations when you have a thin cornea, when we don't have enough reserve to make a flap, or you are in certain activities which put you at a high risk of trauma. Let's say, for example, you're a jiu-jitsu fighter, right? Um, uh, uh, and you do mixed martial arts and your chance of getting hit on the eye higher. PRK might be a choice in that situation. So the default choice in most people is, is LASIK. And this happens many times. We have people who have read both options and discuss with us. And I mean, there's no good, there's no harm as long as you are okay to wait for the eye to recover back uh, PRK can give you similar results, although the road can be much more bumpier. So most surgeons prefer to do LASIK because it 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 solves the first pur uh, first purpose. It is it is it is faster. It's quicker. You go back to work easier. In terms of long term outcomes, I mean it it has a slight edge in terms of how the eye feels after LASIK. So between PRK and LASIK, if if you're a candidate for both. Most patients, most candidates lean towards LASIK. 
right? So next question is, if you are at risk for keloid type scarring, should you get refractive surgery? So I can answer that question again, if Dr. Dalwal is happy with you. So yeah, yeah, keloids is, I mean, that's a good question. So keloid is technically a contraindication. That means keloid is, think, so for those who don't know keloid, because this obviously comes from somebody's own experience, if somebody knows somebody has a keloid. So keloid is, when we get an injury, we get a scar. If that scar is uncontrolled, it's called as a keloid. That is an uncontrolled scar, and you can develop a thick, dense scars when you have keloids. Keloids can happen in the eye also, especially when you make a nick on the eye when you're doing LASIK. So, so when you're doing LASIK or PRK because you're shooting a laser on the eye, we try to avoid patients who have keloid. And in fact, we ask all patients, do you have keloid formation tendencies or not? And we don't do LASIK for them. Okay, so this is interesting. So I've done LASIK on a lot of keloid formers. Oh, good. I, I don't do PRK on them. I, that's, that, that, I that, never that, do, that, I never, right. I never do PRK. Yeah. But the, actually the collagen that is in the cornea mm -hmm. is different than in the skin. So that we, we, for the PRK requires a lot more healing. So you, you have, you have a lot of more, you know, tendency to heal, to scar, et cetera, with PRK, because there's so much more healing you have to do. With LASIK, again, I've done I've done a lot of LASIK in, in keloid formers and knock on wood, I've been fine be, and the, because there's a lot less healings, right? So remember in LASIK, if my hands are your cornea, we're creating a flap with a laser, doing the little sculpting, and then we put the flap back down. And once we put the flap back down, you're 95% healed. You just have to zip up that little edge. So it's so much easier for your eye to kind of tolerate. And there's much less kind of um, impetus for the, for the scarring. But you know, this is so interesting because both Dr. Prakash and I have been refractive surgeons for, for many years. And at, you have to really have a discussion with your surgeon and what they feel comfortable with and what their experience is. It's not the same everywhere. And you just have to, you know, make sure you're, it's like a thoughtful approach. You don't want to say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. Like, you know, it's, you have to like kind of have, okay, let's think about this. And, you know, why are we doing this? And the best thing is to be conservative, right? You never want to be, go to a surgeon who's like, oh yeah, let's do it. It doesn't matter if you have any, you know, severe diabetes and this and that, let's just do it. No, you don't want that. You want, you know, conservative approach is always the best. Um, so that, uh, but there are a lot of different gray zones. And so, you know, there's, there's gray zones in, in our field, especially with the elective um, vision correction, for sure. Yeah, 100% agree with Dr. Dhaliwal on this. PRK, definitely not a good choice. LASIK, yeah, I understand that. Uh, I mean, I agree with her. The, 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 the effect of potential keloid formation is much lesser. So yeah, that's, that's exactly what medicine is. Okay, we have a couple of minutes here. Is it possible to have one of these surgeries after you've had cataract surgery? Great question. So if you have um, a healthy eye, right? So you've had cataract surgery, you don't have any dryness, you don't have glaucoma, you don't have macular de degeneration, and you are able to see well with your glasses, right? Then maybe, maybe you would be a candidate. But remember, as you know, you have an implant in your eye, a lens implant, if you just want to do that reading, like if you have great distance vision with your cataract surgery implant, and you just want to be able, you want to read better, we don't have a surgery yet for that. Okay, so that need for reading glasses to get rid of the reading glasses, we are not there yet. So if that's the reason that you want to have, you know, laser vision correction or, or some type of surgery, where our technology has not caught up with you yet, we're working on it. Okay, but if you're still nearsighted after you know, laser uh, after your cataract surgery, if you're still nearsighted and you don't want to be, then maybe, but remember nearsightedness is a little bit of a gift 
especially as time marches on and even after cataract surgery, because you can read. So you can read with that nearsightedness. That will go away if you have it corrected for distance. Okay, so remember, again, have a, have a detailed discussion with your refractive surgeon about what's gonna happen after you have um, laser vision correction. Okay, and this last question here, maybe for, for people who are considering calling and, and getting a consultation, how long do people have to wait for an appointment for refractive surgery? Might be uh, an interesting answer at these times. <laughs> So that's another great question. And um, we will do our best to accommodate you. We are fortunate. We have uh, four surgeons, five surgeons who are doing refractive surgery. And um, the important thing is that, you know, this is elective laser vision correction. We will get you in as soon as we can, but there is a lot of backlog from the pandemic. A lot of people put off their surgeries and now they're starting to really come back and you know they're really excited to get in. So we do have quite a, quite a long list, um, but we will do our best to get you in as soon as possible. So that's a hard question since I don't do my own, we, neither does Dr. Prakash, we don't do our own scheduling, but we will do the best we can to accommodate you. Please understand that, you know, we've had a little bit of um, a, um, a change in our staffing, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're, we're, we're working through some, some kinks in the system in terms of uh, staffing changes, et cetera. And we are, we'll do the best we can, but thanks for your patience in advance. All right. So that, that wraps up our program, Dr. Dollywall and Dr. Pakash. Thank you so much for joining us and a fascinating presentation. And, and thank everybody for, for joining us today for our program. We'll be back in two weeks in our next program, as we gear up for the spring season, we'll actually be on sinonasal and allergy issues. So that should be a, a timely presentation. So please join us for that. And uh, thank you both again. And we hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And thanks to the Ioneer Foundation. Thanks, Craig, for and, you know, Lonnie and everybody for really supporting us in our research mission and our education mission. And thanks to all of you for tuning in and supporting us and the Ioneer Foundation. It really means a lot. We really appreciate everybody's support. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.